Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Columbia Climate Conversations, our panel on the sustainable fashion revolution. I'm Kailane Costa. I'm a fourth year PhD student in Earth and Environmental Sciences. I'm Carolyn Felix, a senior at Columbia College studying the history of the African diaspora. I want to start by amplifying the work and the words of the Native American Council at Columbia University. The Lenape lived here before and during the colonization of the Americas. We recognize these indigenous peoples of Manhattan, their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. This acknowledgement stands as a reminder to reflect on our past as we contemplate our way forward. We would like to thank the Earth Institute and the Columbia Climate School for sponsoring tonight's event. We're also, we also want to thank Dr. Benjamin Kiesling, postdoc in geochemistry at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and an integral part of the Columbia Climate Conversations team. Tonight's event was imagined, planned, and made possible by Lauren Ritchie, a 20-year-old climate activist, writer, podcast host, and fourth-year student in sustainable development at Columbia. She's the creator of the Eco Justice Project, which is a digital platform that educates on climate justice, promotes intersectional climate action, and seeks to make more sustainable living possible and accessible and inclusive by amplifying the voices of marginalized communities. She's also a writer and content strategist for Brown Girl Green, a youth ambassador for the Plastic, Plastic Pollution Coalition and the co-host of the podcast, Black Girl Blueprint, a platform to center the voices and celebrate the accomplishments of young black women in a vast array of fields. She's also the creator of Columbia Climate Conversations. Please join me in welcoming your moderator and host for the evening, Lauren Ritchie. Everyone, thank you so, so much for coming to tonight's event. I'm so excited for this conversation. We have so many great panelists lined up and I think sustainable fashion is something that we've all kind of been wondering about. It's kind of a nuanced, complex topic. So I'm so excited for these experts to be able to get into it. And without further ado, I will let our wonderful panelists introduce themselves, um, just what the work they do, um, anything else that they'd like to share. Um, so Jasmine, how about you start us off? Hi, um, my name is Jasmine Rogers and I'm a Black and Mexican content creator based in San Diego and I focus on sustainable fashion and living. Cool. Shelly, you can go next. Hi everyone, I am Shelly. Actually, my family is from San Diego, so hi Jasmine. <laughs> I'll have to look for you next time I'm home. Um, I am actually a Columbia College graduate. Um, so Lauren, your background is very nostalgic for me. I used to live in dorms like that. Uh, I'm a zero waste uh, a fashion designer. Um, and also I founded a fashion tech startup called SXD that turns clothing designs and ideas into zero waste ones. Nicole? Sorry, unmute myself. I'm Nicole Benefield and I am from New York and I'm the founder and creator, creative director of Nicole Benefield Portfolio, which is a made to order slow fashion women's contemporary clothing brand. I'm also an assistant professor at FIT in the design apparel department. And Camille, you're up next. Hey everyone, I'm so happy to be here. I'm Camille Tegel. I'm the co-founder and creative director of FabScrap. Uh, FabScrap is a nonprofit and textile recycling service in New York and now in Philadelphia. So more on those details later about what exactly we do. Wonderful, I'm so excited to speak to all of you. I think that the work that you do, I think you're hitting so many different like sectors of sustainable fashion, whether that's, you know, Jasmine, what you're doing like as a content creator, but also the design and the professor and then the, you know, startup fab scrap does such cool work. So I'm very curious for each of you, how you got started in sustainable fashion. I think I'd love to know what kind of sparked your interest in sustainable fashion, but also kind of when did you understand the importance of fashion versus sustainable fashion? Like when did that shift sort of happen? Anyone who'd like to go first can go. I can go first. Um, so actually my my love for sustainable fashion happened when I was in college too, which is really cool. Um, but I always 
had a love for fashion. I just loved being able to like use it as a medium to express myself and like how I was feeling and also just kind of seeing how like it could kind of change my mood. And I just thought it was like super fun, but I grew up in a low income um, household. And so a lot of things came naturally to me like thrifting and having to do DIYs and upcycle and all that. But I felt a lot of shame surrounded, surrounding that. And once I went to college, I wanted to become a fashion merchandising major. And I started, I got my first job and I was spending half of my paycheck at fast fashion stores every other week. And um, I was like, oh, I'm gonna start a fashion blog and da da da. And um, in the midst of that, I felt really terrible all the time and I couldn't really pinpoint why. And then I started learning about the, the labor conditions behind fast fashion. And I was like, ooh, that sucks. But I ignored that for a whole year. And coming into my junior year, I took a ecology and conservation course where I learned to love the environment for the first time. And at the end of it, they're like, everything that you just learned to love is being destroyed by consumerism and predominantly the fast fashion industry. And I was like, I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't move forward in the fast fashion industry if I'm not part of changing it. So from then on out, I transformed a fashion blog that I have from there called that Curly Top and turned into a sustainable fashion one. And I'm continuing to do that today. <laughs> I'll go next. <laughs> so um, I, unlike you, Jasmine, sort of, I've been in fashion, I don't know, I hate to count, but over 20 years. And I've always designed for big brands. And I started working at FIT about three years ago. And um, during the pandemic and the George Floyd incident, there um, was a call to black creators by a company called Resonance. And they develop on a sustainable circular platform. And they put out a call to black creators and they created a program called Be Resonant. And um, I, they said anybody can you know, participate, whether you're a brand or not, um, just as long as you are a black creator. So I had a portfolio, <laughs> submitted my work and I got accepted onto their platform. And that's how I started working sustainably on their platform. So literally just a year I've been doing, almost a year, um, a year would have been in July that I started on their platform. My brand didn't launch until November. So I'm still learning along the way, but um, it's, it's really incredible, all the things that are, are happening um, to sort of address fast fashion and what Resonance is doing around that. I love hearing these stories. Um, so for me, I'm, um, I was born in Asia, so I, I know that a lot of the manufacturing for fast fashion happens there. And growing up, I saw firsthand a lot of the um, pollution that was happening in the water and the fabric waste that was accumulating in the places that I really cared about. Um, so actually, when I was at Columbia, I studied sustainable development. Um, and in fact, I think during my junior year, maybe I had this uh, choice of either flying to LA for uh, a chance to be on the show to design for a celebrity or um, stay in school uh, to, to finish my studies in sustainable development. And I actually chose to study sustainable development because I realized that for me, it wasn't just about being a designer, it was about using design to enable solutions that help us do better um, for the industry. Uh, and that's really move, what moves me. Um, also for, for me, it's something that really drove me to action was I remember being at one of the sustainability panels uh, at Harvard. So I actually just graduated from the graduate school there. Um, and the, we had senators and um, people from the business side all talking about sustainability. And they kept pointing to the younger generation, the college students being like, and hey, you're gonna be the generation that solves this. And I remember one of the college students stood up and was like, what about you guys? You all have the privilege of um, actually knowing people, having the resources, having the experience and expertise to make a real difference. So why are you pointing fingers at us to always um, be the generation to change things? 
And that really spoke to me because, I mean, I'm not that old, but I have a sister who's a teenager. Um, and I thought about myself. And at the time, I was a creative director at Instagram. I did feel like I had a lot of privilege. Um, and, and I felt like I had a lot of resources to do something um, really different. Um, so, so anyway, that's when I decided to put my sustainability study to use um, and uh, stay at Harvard and actually start this startup uh, around zero waste designs. Shelly, it's it's good to see you. I know we've emailed even <laughs> through Fab Scraps, so nice to see you in person. Um, my my journey is somewhat similar in in the sense that um, I noticed a lot firsthand, similar to Shelly as well. Um, so my background and career before Fab Scrap was actually in evening wear design in New York City. Um, I had the privilege of being able to work for really amazing designers and be at fashion weeks and send uh, really, really beautiful, um, gorgeous silk gowns and dresses down the runway. Um, and as much as I really loved it and was very, very passionate about it. And, you know, I had always thought like design was plan A and there was no plan B. Um, I think it was just seeing firsthand like all the waste that was accumulating from each collection, even though it was sampling and, um, you know, smaller scale production at the luxury level in New York City. Um, it was just mind blowing to me how much reusable fabric in particular would be thrown um, to the trash and sent to landfill. And I just remember being a fashion student and, you know, all of those different projects um, where we could have, you know, gotten fabric at like thrift store pricing and or like you know just I, I just started thinking back to my my roots and my beginnings and how there are so many creatives who could utilize that waste that was going to landfill and you know evening wear is admittedly one of the more frivolous categories of apparel um, and it's definitely it's definitely guilty of being more single use because you know, most people don't want to rewear a cocktail dress or gown to more than one event. They always want a new one um, to make that that like statement. Um, and so I think for me, it was just over time, you know, as a designer, um, pu like putting pieces together and seeing a bigger picture um, and kind of getting outside of all those like back to back deadlines to be able to notice, okay, you know, I'm, I'm designing at a luxury level for people who kind of already have everything that they could want. It's designing something that's like single use. And I'm seeing all this fabric that um, I know a lot of people could actually extend the life of being thrown to landfill. And so I started to really ask myself, okay, well, this is a good fit, but you know, what do I really want like my contribution to society to be? Um, knowing that I had certain ideas of how to make that fabric kind of like, I guess, accessible to more people and especially the public, um, because most of those fabrics, especially the sampling samples are usually only available to industry members. So I had all of these ideas um, of how to kind of put it into other hands and then and redistribute that waste. And um, I had, you know, I kind of knew I had other skill sets beyond design. Um, and so it was really just that personal choice of, you know, asking myself, like, what, what do I want my contribution to be and kind of taking that leap, um, which my parents were not happy about. <laughs> I just got them kind of on board with fashion design. And then suddenly it was like, what nonprofits? Like, <laughs> um, so I think in terms of like my personal journey, it's something that I've, I've never regretted in terms of that switch. And yes, like I do, I do miss like moments of design, but there is a lot of creativity um, at Fab Scrap and in, in different ways. And of course, having access to fab to fabric means like a lot of personal um, side projects for design, uh, which is always exciting. So um, yeah, that is pretty much how I ended up at at Fab Scrap and co-founding. Thank you all for sharing. I was thinking a lot about that. The last thing that you were saying about the outfit repeating. I don't know if anyone's ever seen like the Lizzie McGuire movie. You know that one, that line where she's like, Lizzie McGuire, you're an outfit repeater. I think that's the problem with the fashion industry, if you ask me, but we'll get to that later. I think something that's really interesting to me and just hearing about the different stories that you all have or like how you've come to sustainability in fashion 
it's very interesting to think about then like what sustainable fashion means to you or how you would define sustainability in fashion considering that it is so broad and there's so many different facets that go into it i wonder what is what you like look for in sustainability or what does it mean i'd like to jump in and start us off with that um so for those of you who aren't familiar with fab scrap um what fab scrap does is if you think about like cardboard and plastic recycling and how businesses you know sign up for that service and a truck shows up and carts away their waste it's a very similar thing, except it's specifically for fabric. Um, and so, so much of our service specifically catering to commercial waste rather than um, individual clothing waste um, is kind of like built upon the fact that we feel a lot of, a lot of companies should be responsible for their waste, period. Like they they should be, you know, understanding the volumes of what they're creating in terms of waste. Um, there's an estimate that for every one pound of clothing that a consumer throws out, that um, a minimum 40 pounds were actually created, 40 pounds of waste were actually accumulated upstream to even get to that one pound. So there's a lot that happens during the design process and the production process that so much of the public isn't even aware of or knows about, and so much of that is not tracked. Um, and so that estimate of 40 to one is a little scary. And so we, we at FabScrap definitely feel that the industry needs to have some skin in the game and be accountable for the waste that they create. Um, and that definitely is a, a perspective that I share personally, having been in those shoes of a designer and um, you know, having participated in that and added to the waste stream. So I guess I would I would start us off there with, um, you know, sustainability to me is is really accountability and um, really understanding like, or at least trying to like shift one's mindset to try and think about um, domino effects or other consequences for all of our actions. I just want to say I'm a big Fab Scrap fan. It's actually where I first got my fabrics for my designs. Um, and the 40 to 1 ratio is crazy. Um, I, I did actually read about that through Fab Scrap, I think. And um, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I would say for me, like adding to that sustainable fashion or sustainable design, first of all, um, should be about how how you design things so that you never deplete the resources on our planet. So that 40 to one ratio is crazy because we should actually be designing a way that can be circular so that whatever we create with the materials, it gets replenished. Um, and then the second thing from a more design standpoint is that I believe that sustainable clothing, um, they should be things that people really want to wear over and over again. Because I always think about how no matter how sustainable you label this piece of clothing. If nobody likes it, if nobody wants to wear it, at the end of the day, it's just waste sitting in your closet. And that's really what inspired me to start my company to begin with, because I realized right now there are so many sustainable labels, but at the end of the day, if people don't actually want to wear them because they find the design not so great or basic or compromising the design because you're trying to be sustainable, at the end of the day, it's still just waste. Um, so I actually think it's also our responsibility within the sustainable fashion movement to make sure we create really desirable things that people actually want. And I would I would just add to, I think. I think this is my my approach for just sustainable living in general, but I think it really comes down to intentionality. And I think that really answers like a lot of the problems that we have where it's, I feel like when you're intentional in the entire process of designing, or even if it's purchasing, like, yeah, if you are intentionally like adding things into your wardrobe, if you're intentional about like the work environments that people are in, if you're intentional about where you're getting the fabric and materials. And I think there's just such a lack of intentionality, like, there's no way you could be intentional about a 52 week cycle of clothing. There's no way you can actually like really think about it and really consider a lot of the aspects of that. And I think that's what slowing down is. It's just like taking a step back and really like being intentional with everything. Um, I look at it as um, waste, right? How do you minimize waste in um, how you make the garment, uh, when you actually own the garment, that you own it and love it, kind of like what Shelly was saying. 
Um, and then, you know, when you bring trend into the equation, right, it already has that stigma of it's here for today and I will move on and, and it'll be somewhere else tomorrow. And um, minimize the waste in creating it, um, and whether you're using national fabrics or biodegradable fabrics. Um, what I love about um, my brand and working with Resonance is sort of split in two ways. Um, Resonance is developing on their platform. It's taking, imagine a pattern, you know, you have your pattern, the sleeve, the collar, and within that trace of the pattern, that pattern gets printed onto the garment. So there is no take the pattern, lay it on fabrics that are running yardage of something. That pattern has the print already contained in those lines. It only gets printed once somebody on my site clicks, I want it. That, that's the only time it gets printed. So you're only using that amount of yardage that that garment requires. And it's um, digitally printed. So there's a lot less things involved and all that negative space isn't wasted. And then there's the other component of what I do where it's made on demand, where um, I'm using um, upcycling fabrics, I'm using dead stock fabrics. Again, only when a, a customer orders it. So there's no inventory on what I do. There's no such thing as going on sale. If I go on sale, then it's because maybe I'm running out of yardage that I may have, may have secured or, um, or uh, you, that style is being continued, discontinued. But there is no inventory with what I do unless a customer returns something, but then there's always demand to sell it over again. So um, that, that's what sustainability means to me, it's minimizing waste. I think these questions of like waste and the idea of like fast fashion and being on trend are so interesting because they kind of frame the way that we see our clothes, which is an aspect of sustainable fashion that kind of fuels the fast fashion industry or if we were to talk about you know, like Western consumer culture in general, like how have we been taught to think about our clothes? How have we been kind of conditioned that you can only wear things once or that, you know, things happen on a cycle and you always need the newest trends. And I was just wondering what you all think about, you know, that idea of how it, you know, makes, how it allows us to see our clothes, but also, yeah, just how, why is that such a big issue and what can we do to get people to love their clothes so that this idea of being on trend and the waste problem isn't such a big issue? Um, I would say, well, touching in like earlier when I was like talking about my journey, um, when I was buying fast fashion habitually, I found myself just feeling like, like chasing trends is so exhausting and your self-esteem goes down and you're wasting a ton of money. And I just feel like overall, you're not actually enjoying fashion itself. And I feel like when I discuss with a lot of people who are either transitioning out of the journey or like are just kind of explaining like their hate for fast fashion on a personal level, that um, it, it's the fast fashion industry, the, like the fashion industry isn't as enjoyable as it could be. And I think really we just need to be able to redefine what it is and with so, like with slow and sustainable fashion, um, I actually think you're able to really enhance your own personal voice and perspective because I think with the on-demand trends, you're forced to like fit a certain agenda, fit a certain like stereotype and like look, and then people who are outside of that are deemed as like less than. And I think that when we slow down and have sustainable fashion, it's like you could have so many different cultural perspectives and people wearing things that actually make them feel good. And I know for me, once I made that transition, I felt so empowered and being able to like really define like who I am and what I want to wear. And I'm like, I want to wear bright things. I could go ahead and do that. Like, I don't have to like follow the next thing. And I think as, especially as you get older, you see like a lot of trends cycling around and it's like if you loved it at one point you're gonna love it forever and no matter what people say and it's like yeah it's just like the trend cycles just force you to have to keep buying but being able to slow down and like really love what you have is has been one of the most empowering things for myself um i would say at fast Grab in in kind of getting people to understand like why why we do what we do um there's like a reminder of like the resources that went into the fabric itself um and i guess like a, a bigger appreciation for that and i would say parallel to that is also just like the work and um time and and skill that it takes um to go into creating a full garment 
Um, so what we try to do as much as possible is to kind of like teach skills um, in terms of the reuse initiatives that we have. So, you know, we, we have all this fabric and all these materials, but if people don't know how to work with them, then that's not really going to be, um, you know, an easy way to <laughs> redistribute the fabric. Um, so I think we, as much as we try to educate about fabric itself, it's also like the skills of how to do really basic sewing or intro sewing um, or even different like mending techniques. Um, and I really think that that personalization that you can put onto garments is really when people feel like that emotional connection. And I think, um, I, I think the designers on the panel can definitely speak to like when something is more, um, you know, unique or like a little bit low, like lower um, units of something and, and more, um, you know, like limited edition, then that usually like gives like a different sort of spin on it. Um, but we have um, these digital workshops that we do every month um, where we connect with a somewhat, it could be an artist or a designer or someone who just has like a skill that they do on the side, um, whatever it may be. I think the last one we had was like lace appliques and how to like rework that as a mending component onto a garment. Um, and it's just like, honestly like a one hour, um, workshop that you can sign up for for free or if you choose to donate um, in order to support the workshop host then that is an option um, but it's over zoom so you can you can tune in from the safety of your home um, and really just learn how to adopt like different simple alteration techniques or mending techniques um, or maybe an intro into sewing um, and I really think that yeah putting those personal touches or even like being the one to experience what it's like to sew a garment together um, is really, really eye-opening for a lot of people. And then, and then you know, there from there, things kind of like open up to like, oh wait, if I had to do this, that means when I walk into a store and buy something, someone else had to do that. <laughs> and then you know that that awareness kind of grows from there, and um, and then people start paying attention to who is actually making the clothes and and you know, from there, then hopefully people start asking themselves, well, who's making the fabric and how are, what resources are going into that? Um, but yeah, pretty much we start small with <laughs> just workshops um, and, and just sharing the different skills um, that our community has. Um, I think that Western consumer culture is built around buy more and buy it cheap, right? So when you think about um, sustainable fashion, a lot of times it's not cheap. And I think that, and a lot of times it, uh, when you think about sustainable fashion, it doesn't look like fashion, right? Sometimes it's the most simple silhouette, but it's not keeping up with the Zara or an H&M or, you know, any kind of cool um, aesthetic that you might be trying to achieve at a price. But um, I think it's a matter of changing um, per perception of fast fashion, right? Um, like you said, um, Camille, about who sewed that? Like if you're shopping and you purchase something, a top, it's 20 bucks, right? And you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of brands are now saying, oh, it was made with this fiber and we're doing this. Yeah, but it's $20. How, how did someone make this for $20? You have to think about the cost of the fabric how much did the person that sewed it got paid to make it? Like how long did it take them to make that and break that down by their hourly wage? Was it a living wage for that person to actually make it so that it could end up on the rack? And if it is cheap, then sometimes that means that it went into a mass production in order for you to get it at that price, right? So you're buying it cheap, it might be sustainable, but there are a whole lot of pieces just like it in all their other stores, right? So, um, you know, I, I think that it's a matter of changing the Western consumer um, idea around fast fashion and um, investing more in what they own, knowing that this fabric was secured in, in maybe in a sustainable way. Um, someone was paid a, a living wage to make it and it's going to last. Therefore, it's not gonna end up in a landfill or you know somewhere um, that, will impact the environment. So I think that is the biggest thing around fast fashion is it, it comes at a price and sometimes sustainability doesn't meet that price. So, and, and customers want that price. It's that retail therapy, that quick, cheap thrill, kind of like what Jasmine was saying, but you couldn't figure out 
why it made you feel so bad, you know, because you knew the impact that in order to have that piece of joy that somebody had to sacrifice or the planet had to sacrifice for it. I feel like there's so much good comments on like the Western consumerism. And I think there's so much problem with that. I, I also feel like from a design standpoint, um, I think there's an opportunity to shift also the Western way of design. Um, so today, the, the traditional Western way of design is that you start with a design sketch or a crazy idea that you have, and you don't think about what is a resource that's required to make that garment. How do you, um, what are the materials that's available to you? And all you have is this idea that's a sketch, and then others are trying to force fit the resources to, to match that style, match that design, match that trend as much as they can. And that's why for almost all the designs that we wear today, there's like 10 to 30% of the fabric goes to waste, even just in the design process alone. And so for me, I start my company with a lot of inspiration from designs like the kimono or sari that actually starts with the fabric itself. So if you actually start from the resources that you have, the materials that you have as a creative constraint, rather than just dreaming up any trendy thing, um, then you can actually work in a way that takes into account um, the, the resources and in a way that is sustainable from the start um, that can not waste any materials. Um, so I think there's also a lot of opportunity from the design side. And I will also just say one other thing from me as a designer, I, I think a lot about because sometimes sustainable clothing costs more, how do we make people feel like they're getting more out of the garment? Um, maybe we, you know, we don't want people to buy 10 things, but they're only going to buy one. But what if we can make our designs versatile? Uh, what if we can make our designs um, really easy to mix and match with? Um, what if we can make the design so that it can grow with the person? So even if your body changes, this design still works with you. Those are the kind of things that I think a lot as a sustainable designer. So I can design things that will last with people and actually makes them feel like they still have the variety that they love. Um, so for example, we have this like onesie jumpsuit. So personally, I love jumpsuits, but I hate going to the bathroom with them. Um, so we we were made this jumpsuit inspired by the baby onesie that actually has buttons at the bottom. Um, so you can either wear it as a jumpsuit or open it up like a dress. And it was one of our best sellers that people loved. And this jumpsuit, it was one size fits all. But when we actually interviewed the customers, they all said their favorite thing about it was that it fit them perfectly, even though they came from totally different range of sizes. Um, but the way we designed, we thought about tension and releasing your body. We made sure there was space where people might uh, be different in their body sizes. So everyone actually thought it was made for them, even though it was actually a one size fits all design. And to me, that's the magic of design that we have to unlock if we want to crack sustainability. Wow, that's amazing. I love the, the creativity and the innovation that goes into it too, because you're right. I mean, sustainable fashion is more expensive. I mean, just for the fact of, you know, it's not $20 for a shirt because we're paying fair wages. Um, so, yeah, the creativity and the innovation, I think is so, so cool. Thank you for sharing. I think that's um, actually- Can I just add one more thing to that? Okay, you know, like what Shelly was talking about in terms of the pre-development of a garment. Um, and this is something we're working on at FIT as well. And a, a lot of other companies, because we're in a pandemic, how you continue to create and um, without having access to materials is we're into, we're, we have Clo. you know, there's all this digital fashion technology now. So you can just, kind of create all of these designs without having to um, buy fabric. You can see it on a digital avatar, drape your fabric, see how it moves on the form, um, you know, change the color, change the, you know, the, the textures on it, just to see how something will look before you're actually investing in yardage to make a developed garment. You already see it and it prints the, the pattern out once you're done. So all of that, all of those steps are eliminated just by digital technology. Um, I, sorry, I just need to add one more comment. I just feel like what's really cool, this is what I tell people all the time, is that they say sustainable fashion is boring. And I'm like, it's so, it's so cool because I feel like with limitations, you're able to have so much creativity come out of it. And it's like, yeah, you have like fab scrap, you have like all these versatile designs, you have like these, you know, all these like crazy inventions that are happening. And I think even with styling and thrifting, like that's a huge thing too. And it's like, 
you just get super resourceful and I feel like it births really brand new and wild ideas that I feel like traditionally you wouldn't be able to to birth and I think it's this is just an example of that yeah one of the I just, um, oh. Sorry, <laughs> I was just going to say one of the uh, things that Fab Scrap is, is really excited to do with, um, with Drexel University in Philadelphia is that for their senior collections, um, we actually like put together a selection of fabrics for the students. So they actually aren't, they don't really get a say in which fabrics that they have to work with, um, but they're like presented with fabrics that are chosen for them. And then um, in addition to dreaming up a design, um, get, giving a having been given fabrics, um, then they also need to do it with a zero waste pattern. So um, I will say that it's been maybe like four years that we've been doing that with Drexel and all the prof professors keep telling me like each year, it's always just like another level and another level. And it's really just because of those constraints, to be honest, like the constraints actually produce way more creative results. Um, and it really, forces them to think in a different way and to approach um, design in a different way. And so the types of silhouettes that come out of it, um, the types of like shapes and, and different cuts are just like so, so unique. And all the students always say after, you know, like I never would have chosen this fabric myself, but like, you know, I was able to produce this really amazing thing that they're super proud of. And, you know, of course, zero waste patterning, um, which is a whole other component um, and something that really is you know, so innovative and in, in just rethinking silhouettes. Um, so yeah, I will kind of like agree with all of you about how that really just births, like you were saying, like more creativity. I'm gonna Google Drexel's projects after yeah, this. <laughs> um, yeah, please yeah. Do. But um, Nicole, I just wanna say that to your point on digital products. So um, my startup, we're actually working on um, hopefully a successor to Clo that turns any designer sketch into zero waste pattern. So um, I'll keep you all posted, but I'm sorry. Yes, let us know. We'd love to part. Yep. Keep us all posted. I want to know too. I'm invested now. I'm so invested. And I love, again, these conversations about like the creativity because when it's just like a monotonous it's like trend after trend like it gets kind of boring i like the idea of like thrifting or like experimenting it kind of sparks that passion again that maybe drew you to fashion in the first place when you have to get innovative with it so i think that's so cool and i think this is also a good place there was a question in the chat that i think fits in well now about this question of fabrics right and I think there has been like with these new innovative technologies, kind of the idea of biological fabrics. I know I worked before with um, <clears throat> a company that was doing leather, but you know, vegan leather is usually just plastic. So that's a problem, but they were doing it um, with mycelium, which is like the fungus, like mushroom leather basically. And that was really exciting. And I think, you know, I'd love to hear from you guys just like what other like new ideas and approaches and technologies are like pushing these conversations about sustainable fashion more towards, I don't know, this innovation that we're talking about, but also just in terms of like the future of sustainable fashion, like what are you excited about? Or like what type of ideas do you think can keep like pushing the boundaries for sustainable fashion? Um, I can start us off. Um, yeah, there are a lot of different developments in work. Um, I think that I kind of have like a, a mixed opinion on that a little bit, just because um, I feel like sometimes you feel this is a safe space. <laughs> I just feel like sometimes, um, you know, like when when people say that they source fabric that's that's been you know made with recycled polyester, like it's better of a choice, I guess, but it, it sometimes is a bit of a band aid fix um, to the real issue, which is to be more intentional, to, you know, be a little bit more resourceful, to incorporate like zero waste patterning, to like invest in um, technologies and programs that, um, you know, assist with, with less waste. Um, and so I think one thing with technological advancements is to realize that those still take resources. Um, and so it, it's, it's difficult because like some are, are helpful, some are, equally resource intensive, some are um, band-aid fixes, some are, um, you know, just another, it, it's, it's all kind of a mix. Um, and I think that's where, um, 
you know, it, it sounds really, really fancy and exciting. Um, but I think once people really start to like dive in and, and do a little bit of research, then uh, we're kind of back to similar problems um, at the end of the day. And so, um, I mean, one, one thing that has been in work um, that FabScrap has been waiting for is the, um, the larger scale of fiber to fiber technology. Um, that is something that a lot of companies are, are trying to work on. Um, and it's basically like turning fabric back into fabric. Um, and there have been a few other countries that have made some advancements there, but in terms of like the volumes of what, what is technically waste now, um, the technologies just aren't at a place where it can be a solution, like a full solution. Um, so right now at FabScrap, what we do is at our sorting table, which that's how we even decide how we keep fabrics out of landfill after we collect them is to sort them manually by hand um, at our sorting table um, when we're kind of separating what could be reused and what ends up um, being downcycled into shoddy, which is like different forms of insulation. Um, we do separate for 100% cotton, 100% poly, um, wool, and um, and I think, yeah, right now those are actually the main three. Um, and so those particular fibers are the ones that um, are projected to have those advancements finished um, first. <laughs> so we, we just sort those um, so that we're keeping the data and tracking like per week and per month, like what the volumes of those particular um, fibers are. But uh, right now there is, there is no outlet for it and there is no solution. Um, so anything that is not reusable um, that gets, that gets downcycled into insulation, that's kind of like the only, the only option right now. Um, but yeah, I would say technolo technology and like advancements are usually good, I guess. Um, but I think simultaneous to those like advancements, we still need to be working on um, just changing our perspective and our intentions and um, understanding like what our, our actions result in. Yeah, I feel like for me also fabric is something that um, I have mixed feelings about because I hear all about these like fabric innovations, but sometimes they turn out to not be as sustainable as I thought they would be. And other times, um, and, and other times it just makes it so expensive. And I understand that sustainable garments, it's okay if they cost more, but if, you know, the average, I think American consumer um, spends like a thousand dollars to two thousand dollars on clothing every, a year or something or maybe it was like for the whole household I can't remember but it's like not that big of a number so if you are selling clothing that are like a thousand dollars probably no one's really going to buy it and you know as a sustainable designer you're not really making the impact you want to have um, for me, some, something we're currently working on is actually collaborating with a lot of um, international apparel brands where they have a lot of leftover materials that they overordered, um, and we actually turn that into zero waste designs, uh, and that's something that um, we're starting with. Um, uh, another technology, though, that I'm pretty excited about. So currently, um, my startup, SXD, we are part of this innovation lab with the Spanish brand Disigual. And one of the other startups there is called Resortex. And they created this thread that um, basically under heat, it melts away so that it makes disassembling the clothing and the garment really easy. Um, and for me as a creative person that opens so many doors for creativity because then you can start creating modular designs, designs that's swappable, that you can create the pieces of fabric and use it for different things. Um, so those kind of technologies are what I'm pretty excited about. And then for technology in my world, doesn't it's not really fiber technology. It's more about production technology. Um, like I was explaining earlier, how um, the customer orders it first, and then it goes into production. So just streamlining the process and not adding more to waste. The company Resonance, they, they're the ones that do this, and it's pretty. Um, it's a pretty amazing concept. You know, there's still some glitches, and especially with the pandemic, with getting the yardage and everything starts out white 
and then you know print or you know color or shape has been applied to it one at a time but you know that's a, a, an innovative way to think about production and um, how long it, it takes for fast fashion it's a one-year lead time to get something on a rack from the time a designer puts pen to paper this is um minimizing the production lead time by when I put a development sample in, it'll all just be digital. I'll put it in and then uh, by the time I get my sample, which is four weeks later about, at averaging four weeks later, shoot it, get it on the site, and a, a customer can order it at that time. So that's how quickly production and um, is, is becoming, you know, whereas fast fashion, they're making a whole lot in order to get it to that customer. This is making very little, almost zero. The only garment that's made is mine, the one that I shoot on the site, and then a customer buys it. So I think that that's a pretty cool um, way of thinking about production and um, because fast fashion brands, that's not something they can be nimble at and, and be sustainable. That makes a lot of sense. Wow. You, you're all blowing my mind. I think I haven't, I don't really know very much. I think like with not being a designer, not being on the fabric side, I think I don't hear about this very, very much, but that was also insightful and exciting. I'm going down a rabbit hole researching after all of this, but it's very cool. Um, again, we're always running low on time. We have 14 minutes left and I have a couple more questions that I want to get to, but I think something that's really interesting for our audience to try to grapple with is, you know, what it's like to buy from a brand. And we all know greenwashing is a pretty big issue. Um, for those of you who don't know what greenwashing is, it's this whole idea of trying to market themselves as green and sustainable, just but just not actually being green or sustainable or trying to make a profit off of being sustainable, but not actually implementing sustainable practices. So I would love to hear from each of you how would you give advice to people who are shopping at brands that are claiming to be sustainable? How do you tell a difference between greenwashing and real sustainability, but also just what should they be looking out for or even demanding from brands? Even transparency is something that we can start talking with. That transparency is a big part of what it's like to be sustainable. So are there any other things that you guys would like to share in terms of advice for people shopping at brands? Yes, Star. So I think there are a few things. One is that I think it's important for, for consumers to see the full cycle. It's not just about like highlighting a few cool parts of your, your model, but it's actually showing everything from how you source the fabric to how you think about your labor practices, all the way to your packaging and how you design the clothing and how you deliver and produce on demand um, without inventory waste. Um, so I think it's really important to actually see the full cycle. And I think it's responsibilities of uh, brands, including mine and uh, Nicole's, to, to make sure that we do share that even if we're not perfect yet. Um, another thing is I think it's important for consumers to distinguish between like a marketing play and something that represents the entirety of a brand because there are so many internet, large brands internationally where they have you know one or two very small sustainable collections um, and they market the hell out of it. Um, <laughs> but then it drives so many, so much sales for the entire company, but a lot of it is actually not sustainable products. Um, so I think that's another thing to look for. Um, for from my end, I will say that um, as a as a clothing brand, my um, we really think a lot about how can we have more of a dialogue with consumers because back to my previous point, it's not just about creating really sustainable clothing; it's also about creating clothing that people want. Um, and a lot of times when it comes to sustainability, we don't all have the answers yet. Uh, and there's also a lot of gray space. Um, so one example is that um, recently we worked with climate refugees in Bangladesh, actually, and we used wasted um, um, denim fabric in the area, and we turned that into zero waste jackets um, that, um, that were really sustainable and super efficient. And we actually paid these refugees four times the local wage to, uh, to make these jackets. Um, but for, for those jackets, we're debating between should we actually set the dye or not? Um, because so at first we're like, let's not use any chemicals at all. We want to be super, super sustainable in every way possible. But then we realized that it was bleeding dye. And some consumers, they 
don't want to wear the clothing because they're scared to wash it. Um, so we actually created a huge poll among our following and um, among our customers being like, would you rather have us use organic um, um, solutions to set the dye so you don't have to worry about it bleeding or should we not use any solutions at all um, and keep it a raw material and there might be some bleeding that you had to deal with. And actually a lot of people said, actually I will wear it more if you can set the dye for me with organic solutions. So that's what we did. So I think there's a lot of importance to also having that dialogue with with consumers. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump on top of what Shelly's saying about, I look at it um, as a consumer, they're the end user. You know, we could preach all we want, but the consumer is the end user. And if you're a business, your goal is to make money, right? So a lot of uh, companies are driven by greenwashing because like you said, Shelly, it sells. But what they don't tell you is this, what, what, what isn't working in their company and what isn't sustainable. They don't market that. But I think if companies are more transparent, I would maybe trust you a little more. Guess what? We're doing great in this area. We're not doing so great here, but we're working on it. You know, and these are the these are the steps we're taking to make it better. That's like full transparency. But then also the consumer needs to embrace that and understand that they're the cause. <laughs> it's like oil, you know, we can't get off of oil if we stop, if we don't have, you know, cars that run on, on fuel and heat our homes. And if, 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 as long as the consumer is constantly wanting that fashion at a price, it's almost hard to, you know, break the, the barrier of sustainability, you know, um, greenwashing, it's, it's sort of like um, a band-aid on it, you know, it, it tells, it makes someone feel good about what they've done, but not really good because you don't know the whole story behind it. So it's educating the end user. Uh, and I'll, I'll go really quick because I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, I think, yeah, because I, I come more from a consumer standpoint and my main thing that I tell others is just like seeing if the statements and sustainability like proclamation that they're making, seeing if that actually contradicts their business model I think that's like a major red flag. Like if they're like, oh yeah, we came out with this one sustainability line, but then they're producing 52 week cycles of clothing and it's like overproduction and high turnover. And it's like, uh, I don't really know. You're just trying to like suck me into this other thing. And, um, and I feel like that's one of my main things, but also I also tell consumers to like be more gentle and graceful towards like smaller brands and smaller designers who are doing their best. And I think a huge part of that is like the transparency aspect where they're like, I'm doing this thing and I'm trying to work on this area. And I think it's like Shelly was saying, it's like you're working together with the designer and with the label and with the brand to like kind of see it move forward. Yeah, I would definitely second, um, you know, supporting smaller businesses and smaller designers. Um, and usually with those smaller businesses and designers, you are able to research a little bit easier. Like if you're trying to look up information you most likely will find it um, because they're smaller. I would say um, definitely factoring in if you aren't shopping small um, and you're you're going towards like a bigger company, um, factoring in like if they do have take back programs, like where is that actually going? Um, and are there take back programs very specific fibers and materials or are they accepting everything and anything and somehow magically that's being recycled? Um, and so I guess just, kind of taking that question a step further instead of just like taking it at face value. Um, another thing too is again, like a lot of Americans can't, can't shop um, always small designers and, and um, for price reasons, like go with larger companies. Um, but a, lar a lot of larger companies that actually do care are starting to um, invest more in certifications. So I would say, um, you know, if you happen to see or become familiar with, um, you know, Kind of those certifications which for, for those, of, those of you who aren't um, like completely aware um certifications are basically like third parties um that companies have to pay in order for them to kind of give that stamp of approval that that particular product was either made sustainably or um did not involve like certain dangerous chemicals um things like that and that that review process is very intensive and it takes a lot of time um, and a lot of like rigorous testing and um, a lot of like on-site visits for, to even earn that certification and you have to pay for it as well. So if a company sells a product that actually has like that stamp and certification, 
then it definitely went through um, a lot of a lot of hoops. And so it's it's kind of like a a, a more positive sign um, for a bigger company. So I would say to look for for those or become more familiar with them. Thank you. Okay, for our last question, we only have six minutes left. So excuse me, this is kind of long and kind of a catch all question. But one of the questions in the Q&A was basically asking, we do have like a lot of designers here, people who are in um, the fashion space. And a lot of the students were wondering, um, basically how does someone go from making that from a passion into a livelihood? Or what advice would you give to the next generation of young designers who want to work in sustainable fashion? And also in that answer, if you have any last sustainability advice that you'd like to share whether that's you know about like circular fashion or like what to do with your clothes um afterwards just kind of consider this a catch-all end advice question i'm going to jump in um just because i maybe have a little bit more of an unpopular answer um but because of where i sit in fab scrap um I always just really cannot emphasize enough um, that for any of those who decide to enter the fashion industry as a designer, that um, with there being more light shed on practices and with there being more information out there about how um, unsustainable the industry is, there's definitely, I think, more of a responsibility on those who are entering the industry to really, really know what steps you're taking. Um, and again, like kind of going back to my own definition of sustainability and, and that it is accountability, um, that if you really have something that you really, really want to put out there and like add to the world, um, making sure that every single step it takes to get that product into the world is like really thought out um, in terms of not only for your own business to be sustainable, but for that particular product to mesh and marry well with the world. Um, and I think a lot of that challenge is kind of what was brought up earlier about um, the circularity and making sure that whatever system you're creating and putting out there into the world is one that is circular. Um, I, I know that our designers on the panel have a lot more to say and add to that, um, but I think that's, that's kind of my, my two cents. And the last thing um, in terms of advice that I'll give before I let everyone take it away is I know that after these panels, um, everyone's really excited and like, you know, revved up and wanting to make change. And I would just say to like, not lose that momentum. And even if it's just personally, like changing one thing in your lifestyle that you know that you can actually keep up with and like hold true to, um, to at least do that one thing. I know that with sustainability, it's really intimidating to try to do all the things at one time and to hold to it. Um, but the one thing I will just say when you're leaving from this is just to like at least make one change and stick to it. I have a pretty practical uh, advice, I guess. So uh, first of all, I think if you do join a larger corporation or existing fashion brand, don't be afraid to be the rebel and actually challenge how things are done because I think so much of what's happening in this industry today has been done that way for a very long time and there's a lot of room to change. Um, and then the more practical thing is, I do think today, if you're starting as a sustainable designer, there's actually a lot of resource out there for you. There are a lot of grants. There are a lot of impact investors um, and people who are actually interested in supporting you and your work. Um, I'm happy to talk more about this later, but that's definitely what we've tapped into to support our organization. Um, and then the one last thing I'll just leave you with is don't be afraid to reach out to sustainable brands. I mean, I read all of our DMs on Instagram. Um, I mean, we're also not that big yet, so maybe that's why I can do it. But I take people's feedback super, super seriously. And um, my team, we think a lot about what people say about our designs, how we can improve. Um, so don't, um, don't be afraid to reach out. And I don't know if I can jump in just quickly, um, I, like what Camille was saying, upcycle your stuff. You know, I'm always re redecorating my clothes, uh, my clothing to be repurposed in some way, but do your research. Um, I'm a small business. I literally just launched myself. I'm learning about this along the way. And I pay attention to what other brands are doing and to learn like what, what are, what, 
business practices are working in their sustainable world. I'm going to give a shout out to three brands that I'm really loving right now, not necessarily for aesthetic, but um, Autumn Adegbo, I think that's how you say her, say her name, um, Bite Studios, and Christy Dawn. Very, three very different aesthetics and still addressing what um, sustainability is um, in all different kinds of ways. And Nicole Benefield, hey. <laughs> A little shameless plug, I love it. Um, uh, my last bit would just be, I know everyone else, is, else here is a designer, but I think also the fashion industry goes beyond just designers. There's so many other components to it as well. Like I'm over here on the content creation, marketing bubble, there's social media people, but there's also like, um, there's also like you need HR reps within these companies. You need people who are doing logistics, you need accountants. And like, there's so many facets that you can still fit into the fashion industry, even if you're not particularly a designer, which is something I was really sad about because I was like, I'm not really good at design, but I really want to be a part of it. And there's so there's so many areas that we need people who actually care in all these different um, sectors as well. So don't be discouraged with that. And my little sustainability advice is that sustainability, sustainable fashion also goes beyond just buying new. It's a lifestyle. It's in being intentional. It's consuming less. It's upcycling, thrifting, loving what you have. Um, and then buying new kind of comes last. And when you do, you're able to afford these beautiful designers pieces. So, yeah. Wonderful. We are right on time. Those were amazing final answers. So good. So concise. I love it. I cannot thank all of you enough. You've made my evening. This I have so much like reading to do. You've given me stuff to read for my night. So I'm very excited. And everyone, thank you so much for coming. Please make sure to check out our panelists. I've dropped their info in the chat. And yes, thank you so much. It's all thank yous. Thanks for moderating, Lauren. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Enjoy the rest of your thank evening. You. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.